All right, so after these visionary presentations, let's go to the framework puzzle. In other words, how do we make this possible? I'm Lorenzo Muzzilli, I work with the Swiss Federal Office of Civil Aviation. I manage the innovation and digitalization units there. And basically what we do is think about all of these beautiful things that we have heard about uh, tonight and think about how do we actually make this possible? Because all what we're speaking about today at the moment is not possible, is impossible. So we are trying to change the impossible to I'm possible by making law and regulation that actually doesn't kill the idea, but, that, but promotes it. So how do we do that? First of all, for everybody here in the, in the room, what is safety? So the way to make this possible is to make it safe. First of all, if it's unsafe, it's not gonna happen. Everything else, of course, it has to be not noisy and all of that, but first and foremost, it has to be safe. So what is safety? Best definition I've ever found is the state at which risk is acceptable. It's very good, but acceptable to whom, right? Because there are a lot of people that have to accept risk here. So I always say, well, it has to be acceptable to me as a regulator. If it's acceptable to me, it's good. But why? Because I represent the interest, I need to protect the interest of different parties. So in the case of urban air mobilities, there are three parties that are interested in here. Number one are the people flying in the UA. They have to be safe up there. Number two are the people flying around the UA, and number three are the people living under the UA that don't want the UA to crash over their heads, okay? So these different stakeholders have different, actually, safety expectations, and I could, as a safety engineer, I could go on now and speak about 10 to the minus 4, 5, and 6. I mean, my friend Leonardo is here, would be excited, and everybody else that loves safety, you know, really, uh, you know, would be great. But it's difficult to visualize, so I try to make it something easier, maybe, and uh, less numerical, sorry for that. Uh, level of safety, so that's a, that's a spoon, right? So it's a spoon of grain of salt. That's 20,000 grains in a spoon, more or less. So assume that one of those is lethal. <laughs> Will you go and pick that one? Will you try and say, hey, I give you this spoon, take one grain, if it's little you die, you're a 19,999 are not, right? So you could say, yeah, it's not too bad, or you could say, forget about it, it's way too risky for me to pick that grain of salt, right? Now that's the level of safety that you currently have for general aviation aircraft, like the small Cessna that are flying around. Every time you fly in one of those, you're picking that grain of salt, right? The next level up is a bag. Now a bag has 500,000 grains. So now you're changing, let's say 500,000, a million, would you pick that one? Eh, I think we're getting closer to what we want. And then you have like a sack of sugar. That is like more than 10 million grains. Now the likelihood for you to die in the next hour is one in two millions, if you are healthy. So 10 million grains, go ahead, you can pick that one. So now the point, that's the, now it starts with the puzzle. So which one do we choose with the different stakeholders? So when I go back to the, the people flying on the UAM, what do I choose for them up there? Are they, am I choosing the, the spoon, the bag, or the sack? It's a choice. Are they ready to accept the spoon? Are they ready to accept the, the sack? There are people flying today with the spoon. They are happy to fly. I mean, I used to fly. I was happy with, to fly with that. So why not? What about the people around the flying with the UAM? Well, for those, the choice has already been made. They have to be protected with a sack. You don't want to be hit by a UAM while flying around with your, you know, triple seven as a passenger. So those you have to protect very high. What about the people on the ground? Those to me are the most interesting one because do you want to have the same expectation to be hit by a falling aircraft that you have today having 700 aircraft from the presentation you have seen today flying over your head every day. That's millions of flight hours of planes flying over a city. Do you expect that none of them will actually crash over you? Because that's a very heavy expectation. I mean, we will hear from Airbus later. That's a very expensive expectation, right? So maybe you need to start to expect that this thing will fall over your head. And the question would be, how frequently will that happen? Once per year, once per month, once per day? or multiple times a day, like cars, crashes, right? Those are all decisions that we as regulators, and I would say also politically, have to be made. Otherwise, none of this will actually work, okay? So, uh, I wanted to, the safety onion here, 
I want to speak about this because when I, when I paint all these pictures of safety, the question is how do we make sure that this safety is achieved? And what are the levers that we as regulators can play and can move to make it happen and how complex this actually is? So we are looking at an operation flying your mobility aircraft that are happening in an airspace, the airspace above a city, by means of an operator that operates an aircraft, sometimes with pilots, but now the challenge gets even more because we are speaking about UAM even without pilots, right? So it's already difficult enough to keep an helicopter up in the air, but now we want to take the pilots out because it's a big chunk of the money that you have to be spent for it. So, and that comes to us now, operations policy. So let's like look at the different pieces of the puzzle that we have to solve as regulators to make this happen. So from an operations point of view, what are we looking at? We're looking at ground infrastructure. You spoke about, for, today it's about airport, like how do we design those for safety? You know, taking off and landing is typically the most dangerous part of any mission, so do we need to design it them in a such a way that the people are protected? So you will not see them walking around while these things are coming up and down. They will be probably protected somewhere, and they will be very expensive. A helipad two days costs around $10 million for one helicopter to land over, over, over a hospital, right? So, you know, that's the type of money you're speaking about. Autonomy, of course, increasing level of autonomy is linked to liability, changes liability. So whenever I change liability, everything has to be regulated. If I now go to an air traffic controller and try to put in more or less liability than he has today, he will not do his job, correctly so, because in case of a mistake, he will go to jail, right? So we have to take care of liability. Who's liable for what in case of operations that are maybe automatic, more and more automatic, all the way to autonomous. We are speaking about maybe aircraft without a pilot that are operating beyond the line of sight operation, what we call about, there is no one on, on looking around, okay? So these machines have to be able to navigate challenging environments, and so on and so forth. We are looking at operations over people. How are we gonna protect them? Do we allow this machine to fly over crowds or not? Do we allow, do we carve special routes for them? We have seen in the presentation, it's a good idea to fly over, over, the, over the sea, for example, or over, over a river. Is this actually a good idea? Yes, maybe it is. So do we, need to, do we need to make routes for that specifically? Those are all questions that from an operations policy point of view, we have to think about as regulators. Other species, this is probably the most difficult one, airspace policy. So all of these things actually have to happen in the airspace. The airspace is a public good. You know, you cannot just reserve it for yourself. That doesn't work. So it's, it's a very difficult thing. So number one is flight rules. Which rules are you gonna follow? All the rules that exist today for manned aviation do not apply anymore for drones. That's not gonna happen. You cannot fly un un unmanned urban air mobility aircraft with flight rules as they are today. To create those today took, took years, years. There are ICAO rules, but this is like, it's, it's a nightmare. So you wanna change those, you know, better start now. Airspace classes. So that's a little picture of, of, of Boston airspace. You see it's all these little, little colored lines and stuff. That's what you actually need to know if you are a pilot, right? But if I'm flying your mobility, maybe I don't want to have a pilot. So how do I navigate that airspace? The machine has to do it for me. Well, none of that airspace is designed for machine flying. That's an airspace design that is made, again, years ago. Do I segregate or do I integrate? Do I actually create highways in the skies where only urban air mobility go? Or do I actually let them fly around freely? Depend and we, we heard before, do we do point to point? Do we do network? How complex is the network? If it's very complex, then it's not, always, it's not anymore a highway. You actually need the whole airspace, okay? Unmanned traffic management, sorry, acronym up there, you know, uh, UTM, so how are they managed them? Are they gonna manage themselves? Computers are not good at speaking with humans. So you cannot expect these aircrafts to, to speak with controllers, that doesn't work. Computers are good to speak with computers. So you need to create a computerized way to manage these machines up in the sky. Hundreds of those up in the sky, you know? Plus, you have the problem that so far, airspace is a national good. We manage it federally. But when it comes to this, is this still the case? Is this, is, is this okay that San Francisco airport and all these different pins that we're discussing about are managed by the FAA? Or maybe a city wants to have a say there. And if they wanna have a say, how much of a say? That's a challenge. The reason why this is managed federally is not because of fun, but it's because if you fragment the airspace, everything becomes very inefficient. 
So you want to maintain the efficiency of rural air airspace while allowing local and state authorities to have a say. Very challenging. Operator's policy. This is probably not so complicated uh, insofar as an operator of urban air mobility would be similar to an airliner if you want. But if you take one element there, if you take the pilot out of the aircraft, how are you going to manage passengers? I mean, I was recently looking at, uh, at in Europe, there, there is a very, an increase of these unruly passengers. Apparently, there is one every three minutes <laughs> in Europe that is affecting flights. So now I don't have any more anybody on their plane. So how do I, ma I manage unruly passengers? I don't know. Maybe we need to put somebody up there. But then, yeah. Last, aircraft policy. So we need to certify these aircraft. We need to make sure that they are safe. How much safe? Big decision to make. You know, every little spoon, bag, and, and sack, we are speaking about like, maybe 1 million, 10 million, 100 million as a cost of the aircraft. So it's not a choice that is insignificant. It, it can actually make or break the whole game here. Cybersecurity, obviously, it's a clear threat. Failure management, if I do an, an, air, an operation without a pilot, how do I manage all the failures? And again, autonomy is up there. So to conclude, this is somehow the framework puzzle. Now, as a regulator, I am actually enacting framework and policy and laws for each and every one of these boxes. And I can do that by making each and every one of these boxes a spoon, a, a bag, or a sack. But I still need to make sure that overall, this entire picture makes some sort of a sense. Otherwise, none of what we are speaking about today and tonight will ever going to happen. And with this, I'm finished. Thank you.